Um, I have to welcome Pastor Mac and his lovely wife Ruth Ann, who is here today to uh, do our service and uh, help us through this complicated service that I've got going on here. Um, is there any announcements?
So, may we now read in unison. There is a song you have placed within me, O Lord, but I do not sing it very well. There's a joy in the world which you have placed in me, but too often I despair and am not lifted by it. There are those who cry out for my help, but I seek my own comfort instead. You have given me Christ as Savior, but I cannot follow the Lord when I am my own Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Spirit, have mercy upon us. Amen. The saying is sure and worthy of repetition that Jesus Christ entered the world to rescue sinners like me and you. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to his sin and alive to all things that are good. God's mercy never ends. I tell you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You will notice that uh, in terms of the passing of the peace, we're under new restrictions by the state of Ohio given the outbreak of this variant of COVID-19. So we must omit this time of being able to shake hands with your neighbor. You might want to look toward them and nod and wave hello and say how welcome you feel and they feel.
Am I better off to put the light where it is, or would you prefer that I point it up a little more and see me? Where was which fine? Right. Send it down. Good. Electric is always more pleasant to look at. <laughs> All right. At this particular time, I generally uh, spend some moments with the children in the congregation, and I ask uh, Thelma. Uh, if she thought we might have some children here. Well, uh, she indicated she wasn't sure, though I think we have a couple of teenagers in the choir, uh, and uh, she suggested that maybe the big kids who are here this morning might like to participate in this uh, little message. <laughs> I've had people come out and tell me before, you know, I got more out of the children's sermon than I did out of yours. <laughs> um, so, I want to just take a moment, if you wish to do so, because I'm going to be down on the floor speaking. If the choir would like to come down and sit in the front pew, you'll see more what's going on, but it's not mandatory. We'll give them a moment to move. again. Can you hear me all right in the back of the sanctuary? Yeah. Terrific. That's the big boys. Well, I am pleased to be here with you this morning, and I brought along a friend with me. This friend is named Calvin. <laughs> and if you could see him up close, you would see he has pink, pink eyes, and he knows how to wave, you know, and to do a few things. Well, at any rate, uh, we're going to have a conversation, and we invite you to listen in. Good morning, Calvin. Well, oh, good morning, Pastor. It's good to see you, and glad to see you again in church. Oh, church is very important for me. I live under the floor at a Presbyterian church in Elyria in Lorraine County. But when I hear your preaching, I make a beeline to be there. Well, that's good to hear, and you're buttering me up accordingly. Well, Calvin, what do you think we ought to dwell on this morning? Well, I heard that you wanted to talk about things without price. Things without price. Okay, well, what I want to say initially is that there are a lot of things in life that people consider to be of great value, but they go to the trouble of looking at the price tag of those things. And if things don't cost a lot, then they don't mean very much. They're not very valuable. But I know that there are some things that are beyond price that are far more valuable than those expensive things. like cars, or uh, fur coats, or jewelry, or other things like that? No, that's not what I mean at all, Calvin. And if we'll take just a moment, I'll tell you a little story, and it may help you understand what I'm getting at. Oh, good. I love stories. Okay. Well, one time there was a little boy named Martin. He was all of eight years old and in the second grade. And Mark, uh, Martin got in mind that uh, this notion, things are valuable, exceedingly valuable, only if they cost a lot of money. So he got to thinking, and one morning when he came down to his breakfast, he sat down at his bowl of cereal, and he ate it quickly, and then he wished his mom goodbye and kissed her, and he ran out the door. When mother came to the table, she looked, and she was happy to find an empty cereal bowl, uh, but right next to the bowl was a note. And so she picked up the note, and she read what it had to say. And it said these things, what, Martha, what mother owes Martin, whoa, for making my bed 
and keeping my room neat 50 cents for helping set the table and dry the dishes 50 cents for sweeping the carpet once for you 50 cents for brushing my teeth regularly and combing my hair I do that all by myself 50 cents the total of what mommy owes Martin is two dollars well she read the note, quietly folded it back up, put it in her apron, and went on about her business. Well, all that afternoon, Martin was very anxious for school to end so that he could rush back home and see what had been the response to his note. He thought, Mother will be pleased that I'm such a good businessman and I know how to put value on things. And so he hurried home, threw his books down on the floor, and dashed to the kitchen. And there were some snacks for him for after school. And he hastily ate the snacks. And then he noticed there was a note right next to the bowl where the snacks were. And he picked it up gingerly. And he opened the note. And what did it say? It said, what Martin owes, Ma I'm sorry, what Martin owes mother for nursing him through the measles. Nothing. For washing all his clothes. Nothing. For taking him to school. Nothing. For fixing him good lunches and meals. Nothing. The total of what Martin owes mother. Nothing. Well, Right next to that note, there were two crisp $1 bills, as he had asked for. <clears throat> well, what do you think he did, Calvin? Oh, he probably swept up the two bucks. I tailed it down to the local candy store and filled up. Well, I don't think he did. As a matter of fact, what he did was to take the $2, and he went and found his mother she was wearing her apron, and he slipped that two dollars into the pocket of her apron. And Martin said to her, Mother, I just want to love you and do things for you for nothing. Well, now tell me, Calvin, do you think he had learned that there are some things without price that are even more important than the most valuable of things? Oh, he sure did. And I'm going to remember that, Pastor Mac. The next time my mother or father asks me to help out around the house or do some errand for them and so on, I'm going to do it for nothing. <laughs> yes. Well, I think you've listened well, Calvin, and you've learned the lesson of the morning. I'll see you again. Okay, I'll beat you back to Oberlin, I bet. <laughs> First scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 28 to 37. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the t that time will come. It's like the, a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch.
Thank you for that reading, Annie. Thank you also to our choir for the extra time it took to get ready to sing this morning, and to our talented organist as well. Do I understand, organist, that you live in Oberlin also? All right. Well, that's where we live too, in a place called Kendall. That's a retirement community. <clears throat> well, our scripture lesson continues from the second letter attributed to the Apostle Peter. And I read to you from the third chapter in verses 3 through 13. First of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of Jesus coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. They deliberately ignore this fact, that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and an earth was formed from water and by means of water, through which the world that existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist have been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and earth and the works that are in it, are in it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be kindled and the elements will melt with fire? But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Here endeth our reading of God's holy word. Just before getting underway with the meditation, I want to acknowledge that I knew well your pastor, Lynn Anderson. We worked uh, together on a project or two when she was still director of the Highlands Camp that the Presbyterian in those days owned and operated. <clears throat> and I remember serving with her on some committees. Uh, I was concerned to hear about uh, what's going on in her life, and I'm glad that she took a, a, a sabbatical and some time off from ministry, and we would pray for her or speedy recovery and recovery of wellness. With that said, let us pray together. Again, O oh Lord, we hammer upon the rock, which is your word of truth. And we pray that in the hammering, sparks may fly forth to ignite our imagination and our thoughts and to ultimately illumine our way as we continue the journey of life and seek your guidance. So be with us now. Inspire us by your word within our words. Amen. Our thought this morning begins with two expressions that come together and literally leap the years into our own day. The first is from 2 Peter 3. I read it just a moment ago. 
What sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? The key word in this passage is the word wait. It was written in a day of severe persecution for the early church, <coughs> at a time when it would seem that the Christian cause was going to suffer sure defeat. The future was veiled, disaster was predicted, they were simply waiting. And in the midst of all the uncertainties, the light shifted to the Christians themselves. In view of all of the persecution and the derision we're experiencing, what manner of human beings can we be, ought we be? To this first word, wait, bring another from a play written long years ago by Bernard Shaw that experienced a brief uh, but well-received life on Broadway, the play Androcles and the Lion. The play is set substantially in the same era as Christian company, and the phrase is spoken by one of the key actors. He's a gladiator, a professional fighter named Ferovius. Ferovius was a giant of a man, one who embodied force and violence, and yet, strangely, he was a Christian. He was torn between two opposite pulls on his life. First of all, to kill or to be killed in the arena for the entertainment of the bloodthirsty Roman crowds. But, as the new faith taught him, it's with its ethic of self-giving love, I ought not kill. I ought not do harm. And finally, unable to take the struggle any longer, he uh, felt these contradictory pulls on his life. He says, the Christian God is not yet, so I, for now, will take service with Caesar. Well, both of these words, wait, and in the meantime, come pretty close to to where you and I live. For we exist in an era that in so many ways may be described as the meantime. We find it hard to see ahead one year, let alone two or three, and in so many ways we're just waiting. It doesn't appear yet what we shall become. <clears throat> shall we... Uh, experience and become a globe where the pandemic has wiped out most of the human race? Uh, or will we have some breakthroughs in medical technology and in convincing people the value of vaccination and get past that? <clears throat> Indeed, shall we be a planet in which nations get torn apart by increasing polarities between the races, the sexes, political views, lifestyle differences? Or shall we be a, an earth on which people have learned to affirm human rights, to respect and embrace human differences, to be guided by universally held codes of decency, honor, and justice. To give a few examples, we note the seemingly endless bloodshed in the Middle East. Now, Hezbollah recently have shot rockets into uh, northern Israel, and Israel has retaliated. And we wonder, because we know this has been going on since 1948, whether it will ever end. We witness all around us the polarizations in America, minorities versus majorities, <clears throat> male against female, homosexual against heterosexual, religious liberals against religious conservatives, Democrat against Republican. 
We watch while politicians engage in cynical charades, sidestepping admission of wrong and jumping to put blame on others, using the privilege of office for self-aggrandizement and running down the views of opponents. What in the world is the future going to bring? Chaos or a people who have learned to live with tolerance and to import and affirm the importance of values and of rational compromise. Sometimes it's like hearing a giant cosmic clock ticking, like the countdown before a spaceship launch. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Well, from a different perspective, our generation is certainly a meantime era. In its contrast with the stability of time, some here will remember the glorious celebration of the ending of World War II. Then the United States and its allies had overcome the most demonic power the world had ever known, Nazism and its inhumanity. Justice had been achieved. America and the victorious allied nations represented the greatest power on earth. And there was a general sense of relief that countries had been triumphant uh, in which fairness, peace, and justice were held to be sacred. Echoing the words of Woodrow Wilson after the armistice following World War I, some journalists claimed, quote, honor has come back to the earth, unquote. But then, my friends, there came Korea, and Vietnam, and Desert Shield, and Herzegovina, and our problems in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. <laughs> America, the mightiest nation on earth, had to settle for face saving compromise, as we seem to be doing in Afghanistan now, and even some despair over our inability to achieve lasting peace. Today there are no intoxicating slogans, no parades, just the somber, somber realization that human nature hasn't really changed that much over millennia. Well, in this time, there are great numbers of people who have made the choice of the gladiator for obvious. And they say, I must serve the gods that are, and they do so. Many do it in the world of business and economy. They say, this is a corrupt age. Who can doubt it? <clears throat> the Christian God is not yet. Ideal conditions for life and honor just don't exist. It would be fine to live in a world where honor rules, but that's obviously not now. So in the meantime, they say, let's not be fanatic, butting our heads against a stone wall. So they cut corners on service. They overcharge when possible. They exploit where they can and serve the gods of greed and of gain. You and I can be sympathetic with this kind of difficulty. We know how hard it is to make a cross street left hand turn in the midst of moral traffic. It's like street traffic. I remember painfully an experience some years ago when driving a rented car on the boulevard surrounding the great forum in the middle of the city of Rome, Italy. Mrs. Peel and I were on a vacation after I had completed studies in Holland. Suddenly, Mrs. Peel, who's sitting here, navigating with the lap, uh, map on her lap, shouted to me, we've got to go left at the next corner or we're lost. Well, half of the cars in Italy, it seemed, were coming behind uh, for me, and half were coming behind me. So I just put out my left arm, pretended to be waving, 
and went ahead and turned amidst the squeals of brakes in the most colorful Italian I had heard for our whole trip. It was so much easier that way. Well, others make the choice of the gods that are in the area of standards for personal living. Many say or feel without saying it, just strike a mediocre level with no nonsense about it, no painful ethical striving. It's so much easier that way, and it will save a lot of trouble. Or have you heard in the crescendoing, crescendoing rhetoric surrounding the uh, efforts to uh, impeach Governor Cuomo of New York State, the claim made that what one does in his or her personal life is irrelevant to what one may do in public life, and don't accuse me of stuff that can't be proven. The late, great British historian Arnold Toynbee has written that every civilization has perished being overcome by barbarians from within long before it was overthrown by barbarians from without. Barbarians are mass men and women, people who hold no high standards for themselves, who take pride in mediocrity. If such people admire anything, it's success, the smart operator, the fixer, the one who gets by, whatever the costs. They're so easy, the ruling codes and fashions, the gods that are. But the real question is, what is the alternative to serving the gods that are? To put it in the manner of, of Second Peter, what kind of human beings ought we to be, can you and I be in the meantime? Well, I believe three things need to be said, and I want to say them in my time remaining. The first is obvious, and yet so big. You and I can refuse to call the wrong right. You and I can refuse to call the wrong right. You know, this has been the great service of Christian minorities in all ages. It can be done in our personal world and in the larger world of powerful wrong. Several years back when I was serving a congregation, our common feeling, a man overcome with our common feelings of helplessness, asked me, Mac, what can you do when you can't do anything? Well, it was a tough question. I had no answer at the time, but later my mind drifted off to a little company confronted by just such a question. It was the group of disciples viewing the crucifixion, and it was pathos in simple record. They stood watching. There, the best they had known, their hope for the future had gone down in crushing defeat and been nailed to this cross of wood by the Roman soldiers. But there was one thing these disciples did not do. They didn't look at Jesus on the cross and say, well, that settles that. Pilate was right. Caiaphas, the high priest, was right. Judas the betrayer was right, Jesus was wrong. No, instead they said, wrong is wrong, no matter how powerful, no matter how popular. And history has put its seal on that answer in the birth of the Christian church and the power of our faith to achieve justice in race relations to call for peace in the midst of war, to shape Western civilization through its teachings. That instrument of execution and shame, the cross, swayed and still 
sways the future. And the power to make that denial rests on something deeper. Faith in a stronger power than wrong. It was so with that group at the crucifixion. They believed the last word was not spoken by iron nails. Faith is a stronger power than wrong. Faith is a stronger power even than Washington, D.C. In the meantime, Ira, you and I can have faith in a spiritual order beyond of life, beyond the gods that are, in the gods of our fathers and the God, rather, of our fathers and mothers, the God of justice, of righteousness, and of mercy. There's a second thing we can do in addition to refusing to call the wrong right. The second thing we can do is hold fast to the truth that quality of life outweighs quantity on the only scales that finally count. That quality of life outweighs quantity on the only scales that finally count. Uh, the late Oscar Wilde is said once to have cried out, why give me the luxuries of life and I can deal without the necessities. As Wilde intent, Wild intended it, that was idiotic rabble. But in a deeper sense, it is profoundly true. The finest luxury of life, my friends, is honesty of mind and chasteness of spirit. The easiest thing, of course, is to accept the judgment of a news commentator once made about our current lifestyle. Life is a game, he said, in which everybody is offside and the referees have been chased from the field and there are no rules. But my friends, there are rules and there is a referee. To keep an ethic undebatable in the midst of debates that swirl all around us is the top prize of life. In the meantime, amidst all the uncertainties, you and I can keep that. But what? when we take the line of least resistance that always runs downhill, and when we say, oh, it doesn't make a difference what I do in my private life, then a paralysis of character and personality sets in. Listen to these classic words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great pulpiteer of earlier America. He wrote this, In the darkest hour through which the soul can pass, whatever else is doubtful, these things are at least certain. If there is no God, and no afterlife. Yet, even then, it is better to be generous than selfish, better to be faithful than adulterous, better to be true than to be false, better to be brave than a coward. Blessed beyond all blessedness is the person who, in the tempestuous darkness of the soul, has dared to hold fast to these venerable landmarks. In the field of art, we're familiar with what's called a one-man show, or a one-woman show. Now, such a show or an exhibit can be a very tiresome thing to attend, <clears throat> reminding me a bit of a tenor practicing the scales, who seems to be hung up on one note. Me, 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 me. But the one-man show can be, as it has without number, a very exciting time. In moral choices, my friends, we are called upon to hold one-person shows. Like you this Christianity or not, has it your voice to be true? It isn't a matter of majority, but of choice. Does it get your vote 
even if in some, some contexts <clears throat> it gets no others. Then there is third and finally <clears throat> another, another truth I want to articulate. Something we can do, you and I, in the meantime. Hold on to the truth that one life counts. Hold on to the truth that your life, one life, counts. This is so hard to do in a time when so many great impersonal forces are swirling all around us. But the real truth is found in a line about the Continental Congress of our early nation's history, deciding to take their stand against British injustice. They signed many minority reports that became majority actions. They signed many minority reports that became majority actions. You know, there's a lot of history in that sentence. Think about that desperate Christian minority in the days of the Roman Empire, when the religion was not even recognized as legal by the Roman state. They sign minority reports and continues have done so throughout history. Against the murder of female babies in the Roman world because only males were preferred. Against slavery and racism as under the leadership of Martin Luther King, a Christian pastor from Atlanta. Against cruel exploitation of workers in early days of the Industrial Revolution. Napoleon said something like that. Speaking of the American Revolution, he said, the greatest issues in the universe were decided by the skirmishes of picket guards. And they were. The Congress in Philadelphia bravely declared we hold these truths to be self-evident. But they weren't, except to a few philosophers and poets. The average size of the American army in taking on the great British Empire was about 5,000 men. Picket guards. Picket guards. That's a great role. And it's the, it's the role that we Christians are called upon to play. So, what have I been saying? We refuse to call the wrong right. And secondly, we recognize that the quality of life outweighs quantity on the only scales that finally count. And finally, we hold fast to the truth that one life counts. There's an alternative to serving the gods that are. It's to take service with him, whose service is perfect freedom. This is my counsel for living in the meantime. I hope it falls well upon your ears. Amen.
Lord's Church in this place and its work be put in the offering plate that is found to the rear of your sanctuary. So we will not be passing it among us. May we pray together to dedicate that offering. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a gift, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Would you join me now in the prayers of the people, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. O you who comes to us in the silence of eternity, and who speaks a word, which becomes flesh and dwells among us in Jesus, we thank you for making yourself known and your eternal love affair with what has been created. We ask your special blessing upon this church as it seeks to reemerge from the long night of battling the pandemic. And we pray also for our nation and nations around the world as they similarly continue this tireless struggle. Grant to our planet new healing new life. In the name of the great physician we pray. We ask also God that you will be with each of us and our families. Help us where there is discord to achieve new harmony and new understanding and new patience. Let us recognize the good that we do for one another and not be hesitant to say thank you for deeds freely and lovingly done. We pray, O oh God, for our government, and we ask that amidst all of the political rhetoric and the standoffs that are occurring, that we remember how much can be achieved if we don't mind who gets the credit, and if we do learn anew the lesson of cooperation is better than opposition. We pray, O oh God, for those who keep the peace in our culture, for the brave women and men who serve behind the badge, who would bring the peace, who are not there to threaten or to kill, but who are there to bring about justice and happiness among us. We pray, O oh God, as well for our border guards, and their very daunting task these days. And we ask that government and border patrols cease being in a standoff and work in new ways of cooperation, both to recognize the value of the lives of those who have traversed many miles to come to America and the promise she brings. <clears throat> but also, <laughs> we pray indeed for those who struggle to keep the peace. We pray as well, O oh God, for all who are sending their children back to school or contemplating doing so in the near future. Grant them wisdom as they make decisions about how best to prepare those children to re-enter the classroom and to do the learning that will equip them for responsible life in a free society. Bless the teachers as well, and we thank you for their dedication. And all of these prayers we do make in your son's name, along with that which he taught us when praying to you to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
So consider yourself fairly warned. <laughs> and now may the gods of God of our fathers and our mothers, the God whom we know in you, surround us with your love, your strength, and your courage. Grant us safety in our lives. Grant safety for those we love and serve. And be with us on our respective journeys through the life with which you have blessed us. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.